I bring you greetings from my country, Somaliland, a country in the Horn of Africa that you probably have never heard of because it doesn't exist on your map. It's a former British Somaliland protectorate. It's next to former French Somaliland, and I will point it. French Somaliland, British Somaliland, and La Somalia Italiana, and I'm going to show that you all know about. I come from here, Somaliland, which is peaceful, stable, a country that I have returned to 22 years ago when I retired from the World Health Organization. Between 82 and 91, there was a civil war. Our cities got flattened, bombed. Mass graves got filled with the bodies of innocent victims, mostly children and weak women, those who could not run away from the bombs, because cowards always pick on the weak. And at that time, I was a very senior diplomat in Djibouti as the representative of the World Health Organization, an organization that I served for 32 honorable years, and my country had nothing. Homes destroyed, hospitals destroyed. A quarter of a million people died, and a million people sought refuge wherever they could in the world. Many went to Ethiopia, next door. Many came to your shores and came to other countries in Europe and America. Our people got scattered. Our people ran wherever their legs could carry them. And many brought children. And at that time, there was nothing I could do. But in 91, when Somaliland separated from Somalia and peace returned to my country, I planned to prepare for my retirement and to go home. So in 97, at the young age of 60, I recycled my life and went home and built a hospital. But I want you to know what drove me there. This is a hospital, this is a maternity hospital. Who bombs hospitals? People build hospitals and improve on them. Whatever little we had was bombed. So I went home and built a hospital. But it's not the hospitals, it's not the bricks and the mortar that treats and looks after the sick. It's skills, it's nurses, it's doctors, it's pharmacists and lab technicians. It's people who are taught and trained the discipline of medicine who look after the sick. So without nurses and without, with 18 doctors in a country that is as big as England and Wales combined, there were about 17 or 18 medical doctors. So I embarked on the task of training nurses. I could not train doctors because I'm not a doctor, I'm a nurse, I'm a midwife. So we started training nurses. Now you train people who've had an education, who've been to school, who know about science and biology and physics and chemistry. The young people who came for training were people who were brought up uh, in refugee camps and who were taught to read and write maybe on sand so we had to improve their basic education and then start introducing the science of nursing, of patient care, of dosage of medicines, of dressings, of sterilizing equipment. And this was the most passionate responsibility I've ever had in my life. It was a time when I had to use every skill that I had ever learned in your countries. Britain never trained me for this. Britain trained me to work in the fantastic hospitals in Europe. America never trained me for this. I was trained for different standards, where there were hierarchies and responsibilities and people you could run to when you did not know what, needed, what was required of you and say, now, how do I do this? or explain this to me, I was all they had. And from that first lot of 300 girls who applied, we took 40, trained them, 
And what I'd like to tell you that the top students from there I sent on to medical school. My chief surgeon today is one of those young girls who learned to read and write on sand in a refugee camp who is today my senior surgeon. They call her at night to do surgery, not me. She is assisted by other doctors and pharmacists and equipment sterilizers, people who were trained on a site that was once a killing ground. And this is one of my army, one group of midwives graduating, and we have now trained over a thousand, and we send them out throughout the country. You've heard of barefoot doctors? Well, I send out brain-full young women who know how to look after a woman who's pregnant, who know how to get a baby out as safely as they can. But then there's an obstruction, there's nothing I can do anything about. It's a problem of female circumcision. Female circumcision, by the way, before I get to it, the hospital is for men and women. We have skills, we have competences, and we don't discriminate against anybody or any nationality. So we often have male patients as well. But what brings me to your shores one more time, because this is the 11th or 12th time I visited your country, is to speak about something I spoke about in 1978, where nobody else would listen to me, where I would be speaking at the Institute in The Hague of Social Studies to speak about the problem of female circumcision. Little girls in Africa, in 16, 17 countries in my continent, Africa, a country that has great culture and great traditions, there is one hard tradition that we need to fight, and we need you to fight with us. A little girl is healthy, survives disease, survives war, survives not stepping on landmines, not get bitten by a snake or eaten up by a wolf at the ripe old age, beautiful age, where she runs to the door to meet her father, her hero, where she plays and talks and reasons, we catch her. And we cut away her genitals. And we damage her for life. We maim her for life. And we damage the part of the body that was created for her to reproduce and bear as children, allow the passage of children but we damage it. It forms scars that will obstruct the baby and will not let that baby that she wants to bring to this world out through this damaged passage. And my appeal to you is to help us fight this with respect, with dignity, and to encourage the women, the men and the women, and particularly the men, because that little girl has a father. That little girl has a hero. That little girl has a father who's the head of the family. And I want men to join this battle. It should no longer remain a battle that is to be fought by little old women like me. I'm 82. My gun doesn't shoot that far anymore. I need people with hearts and conscience who believe in human rights, who believe in the rights of the child, who believe in the dignity of the human being to help us fight it and to educate us and to help us with, with knowledge because that's the biggest gift you can give to anybody. Where would I be without knowledge today? Where would I be without access to schooling and, and to be taught by the best? We need to protect our, protect our children. We need to protect their future. We need to protect their bodies. This little girl who's seven or eight who cannot defend herself from adults, needs a collective, co collective protection. Female genital mutilation has no place on this planet. It is totally against the teachings of Islam. It is totally against medical practice. It is totally against human rights. It's totally against the dignity of the human body. It is amputating vital organs of a female. This has no place in this day and age. And I leave this appeal with you, parents. 
responsible people who believe and lead in human rights and human dignity. Because this child only has you to protect her. Some people are taking their children out for holidays only to cut them up, only to damage them. I thank you for this great opportunity and I leave this in your conscience. Do what is right. Do what is right for that child. Thank you.